Welcome to the AI Chat Podcast. I'm your host, Jaden Schaefer. Today, we have the pleasure of talking with Jake Heller, who is the CEO of Case Text. He is a former Stanford University Law School graduate, and Jake Heller most recently worked as an associate at Ropes and Gray before branching out in 2013 and founding his own company, Case Text, which is now based in Palo Alto, California. Originally a Y Combinator backed legal tech startup, Case Text recently sold to Thomson Routers for $650 million. Have you ever wanted to start your own podcast? I record and publish podcasts on a platform called Spotify for Podcasters, and I absolutely love it. Essentially, you can upload from your phone or computer, and it distributes to every platform that plays podcasts. They support video podcasts, and you can make money on the platform with ads or even podcast subscriptions, something that has made my life so much easier as a podcaster. So if you're interested, I highly recommend you give it a try. You can download the Spotify for Podcast app or go to spotify.com slash podcasters to get started on your podcast today. Jake, can you give the listeners a brief, first off, welcome to the podcast and uh, happy to have you on. And can you give the listeners a brief overview of kind of case text and its mission in the legal profession? Totally. Uh, So first of all, thanks for having me on. Very happy to be here. So since 2013, what we've been uh, trying to do is bring the best in class technology to the legal profession. Um, we believe that when lawyers have great technology, uh, they are able to provide much better, uh, less expensive, um, and more high quality services to their clients. Not unlike the way that if you give a doctor access to better machinery, like an MRI, they can uh, get better healthcare to their patients. And you know, it was started in part because when I was practicing law, I, on the one hand, when I was you know, working at the law firm or in government or in a nonprofit, if I wanted to do something that, that was pretty simple, like find a, a relevant precedent for uh, an opinion or for, for a brief that I'm writing mm-hmm. or, uh, you know, find the right piece of evidence and, uh, you know, what's a process called discovery, I would spend like many nights in a row up until two or three, I'm just trying to find the right information. And at the same time, if I wanted to, op- you know, go to my iPhone and Google for an open Thai restaurant near me that serves vegetarian options. That was like really trivial. Right. On the one hand for like really important stuff, you know, law where there's like life and death in line or a, you know, business might be going out of business if they don't get the, get, get the ruling that they need. On the one hand, right. It was very hard to use legal technology to find that information, but I knew the technology is out there because it's on my, on my phone, just on Google to find like really trivial stuff. Right. That's incredible. So I know that, um, you know, you, you started this back in 2013. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about like what the process for that was? You were working at a law firm, you were, you know, doing your own thing. What kind of like helped you make the decision to, to pivot and actually start this company? Because, you know, that that's a big step going from, you know, a, a presumably, um, you know, stable job to all of a sudden becoming an entrepreneur and, and kind of branching out. Yeah, it's funny when I made the decision, it was actually very easy because at the time I thought, well, either this will crash and burn or be immediately a smashing success for either way I'll find out soon. And if it crashes and burns, hopefully they'll take me back as a lawyer. And what everybody told me when I started the company is that, Jake, you're signing up for a 10-year experience. And for some reason, I just didn't listen. <laughs> I didn't, didn't realize that, you know, there was like the third option where it takes a very long time to build and build and build and build, build something, build something amazing. Mm-hmm. At which point you either do what we did, which is the exit, or you, you just keep on going and try to go for IPO or whatever. But, um, you know, at the time it was actually pretty easy. I kind of said I quit and left the firm and just started building. Uh, and, you know, I think, I think there's another piece of this too, which is you need to have a naive optimism. I believe mm-hmm. when you're starting a company at the time I was, I was thinking how hard could it possibly be to get all government, you know, all, all case law statutes, rules, regulations into a database. How hard could it possibly be to build the technology, the search technology and information technology around this? Um, you know, and the answer is it's extremely hard, <laughs> right. but, um, but you, you know, I, if I, if I had known how difficult it was, maybe I wouldn't start the company, which is actually, you know, you need this naive optimism to just get, kind of get going. Yes. That, that's interesting. That's actually a, a concept I've heard from a number of people, you, you know, like yourself 10 years in, they're like, had I known the pain I just went through, you know, but, uh, of course there's no, uh, without the pain, there's no reward and you've built an, an absolutely incredible company. How have you kind of seen the company's vision evolve since you, you know, founded it back in 2013? 
we definitely have evolved a lot and what's driven it primarily is what we can do with the state of the art of artificial intelligence when we started in 2013 i was not a believer in artificial intelligence natural language processing had very limited application at the time and a lot of the companies who purported to be the artificial intelligence space at the time were either like making it up or not doing that interesting work but as we all know the state of the art here has shifted dramatically and now our product is based entirely around uh, large language models and specifically you know heavy heavy use of technologies like gpt4 so um what what we view it as as we're building our company is that that underlying technology and the underlying shift is an enabler for folks like us um to provide way better way more comprehensive services to our clients and it's just shifted dramatically over time and to the fast forward to today um leading right up to the acquisition by thomson reuters you know we have uh, an ai we call co-counsel mm -hmm. that is essentially like like hiring another attorney to your firm mm -hmm. it can review documents for you do legal research for you um, review contracts for you edit contracts based on your instructions and, and much else that was unthinkable a decade ago just absolutely like if we if we pitch that you know we'd sound like great visionaries right but also be laughed out of the room for tech technological and feasibility and, and now it's it's the reality it's amazing this episode is brought to you by shopify Forget the frustration of picking commerce platforms when you switch your business to Shopify, the global commerce platform that supercharges your selling wherever you sell. With Shopify, you'll harness the same intuitive features, trusted apps, and powerful analytics used by the world's leading brands. Sign up today for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash tech, all lowercase. That's shopify.com slash tech. That's incredible. And I've actually looked at the demo of your product on your website. I'm really impressed by, uh, you know, what that is able to accomplish. Um, so I really do believe Case Tech is kind of like a leader in the legal AI market right now. What do you think sets you apart from other competitors in this space or even newcomers, right? I believe um, there's like Harvey AI and some other big AI companies that are kind of uh, starting up and, and getting funding and whatnot. What do you think uh, is the big differentiator here? I think... There's this new and emerging field that we're participating in that we call kind of an AI legal assistant. And for its worth, kind of zooming out for a second, I think in every profession, there's going to be an AI assistant built, mm -hmm. built for that profession, you know, for yeah. finance, tax, and accounting, et cetera. And we hope to actually help build some of those at Thomson Reuters since they serve all of those categories as well as the news. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think, I think it's, you know, less than, in less than five years, every single professional is going to have an AI assistant and it's going to be as commonplace as having a smartphone or email or, or other kind of basic underlying technology. It's just that powerful. Yeah. You just cannot not have one of these things as a professional over the next four or five years. And so looking at what we do at Case Techs, we, we focus on a few things that we, we view as really important for building a, um, a good AI assistant. We believe it needs to be reliable I think a component of that is it needs to be citable. So when it's doing work for you, it says, I've done your legal research, for example, or I read these documents. Here's the answer. And here's where I draw that information, mm -hmm. which lets the user verify that it got the right answer. I mean, it usually does anyways, right? But right. Um, just you know, like, like a good associate or good, um, good assistant, it's going to say not just here's the answer, but here's why you should believe me. And here you click, click this link and you can read that part of the document, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So it needs to be one, reliable. Two, it needs to be scalable. Um, you need to, uh, professionals deal with not just um, kind of a chat-like experience, uh, but also they read to those thousands or millions of pages of documents to reach a conclusion. And so this AI needs to be able to also read thousands or millions of documents to reach a conclusion. Uh, and you know that means you have to kind of break out of the normal chat paradigm and go far beyond that to mm -hmm. behind the scenes, you know, reading through hundreds, thousands, or even you know, tens of millions of documents to reach a conclusion or an answer. Um, and finally, it needs to be secure and private. Uh, for professionals, especially lawyers, you're dealing with sometimes extremely sensitive information. Uh, it could be highly personal information, or it could be information that uh, is incredibly critical to a business. Yeah. And we need to develop AI in a responsible and secure manner. <clears throat> TIAA is on a mission. Why? 
because 54% of Black Americans don't have enough savings to retire. So in collaboration with big name artists like Wyclef Jean, TIAA released Paper Right, new music inspiring a new financial future. With 100% of streaming sales going to a nonprofit that teaches students how to invest. Stream Paper Right now and help close the gap. That, excuse me, that, that puts uh, companies in a place where they understand that, that as they're you know, asking the AI to analyze this data, it's not, for example, learning from that data right. and thus potentially disclosing you know, in a future, uh, future session secret information. Yeah. So, so I think, I think, you know, what you're going to see is AI assistants emerge that try to nail all three of those, uh, you know, it has to be reliable, has to be scalable, has to be secure. And if you can pull that off, then I think you're uh, a long way towards getting a really strong AI assistant. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, uh, that's gotta be critical. Something that a lot of people have been, um, you know, obviously know about it. It's been in the news a lot, so I'd love to pick your brain on it. There was recently a case um, where essentially, you know, a lawyer used some, I think, believe chat GPT or something, and it was with a lawsuit with an airline. Um, and in the course of that uh, case, it, you know, it cited some fake cases and um, he got in big trouble. How does your platform, how does your co-counsel kind of um, you make sure that you're providing accurate, reliable information and avoid situations like that? It's a great question. So so to that first point that all AI assistants need to be reliable, that's possibly the, you know, not possibly, it is the most important thing towards AI assistants that actually work for um, for professionals like lawyers. So unlike ChatGPT, where you're just having a conversation with it, and it's answering everything almost from its memory. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're working with a platform like CoCounsel, it's going to review documents first and base its answer only on the information contained within those documents. Okay, got it. And that enables it to get answers that are recent because it's access to a databases that are updated daily. It also allows it to uh, ground its answers in, uh, you know, in real in real documentary evidence. The, the analogy I like to use here is when you're working with ChatGPT, imagine you're you're talking to an incredibly smart, incredibly well well read. Um, person yeah. who is taking like a closed book exam mm -hmm. where they're going to get credit for answering every question. So they're going to try their best, but their memory is imperfect. And so if you say, find me a few cases about airlines in New York, it might say, oh, well, the Smith case is a great case. And it turns out maybe the Smith case, like they misremembered and the Smith case does not exist. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you take that same underlying technology, but find a way to make it an open book exam and give it unlimited access to, you know, millions and, and even billions of pages of documents and abilities to search for those documents and read them before providing the answer. That same very smart person is going to do a much better job on that task. And that's what we've seen in practice. Yeah, that's incredible. Um, I definitely think that's, uh, that's got to be really critical to it. So based off of, you know, what you're seeing with co-counsel and how it's kind of handling documents, um, reviews, legal research, memos, all that kind of stuff, how do you see the role of human lawyers changing in the future? Is this something that is going to replace them? Is this something that augments them? How do you kind of see that relationship in the future? Um, I, I think that that the first thing that's going to do for human lawyers is to make them more human. Uh, uh, what you do as a lawyer, especially as a young lawyer, is a lot of what um, a very senior managing partner at a law firm I was talking to described as ditch ticking. Okay. You're just reviewing thousands of documents manually. Um, and you spend a lot of time as a young lawyer thinking, why did I go to law school for this? <laughs> you know, can, can anybody do this? And I think that now that, that we lawyers can delegate these sorts of tasks to an AI, the, what that frees up for us, in fact, requires us to do is take on much more difficult, interesting, um, and interesting tasks, uh, strategy, working with a client, um, all, all those kinds of things are going to be so much, so much more important as you you know, as you, as you get to delegate tasks to an AI. I also think, um, paradoxically, I think it's going to increase jobs. What we've seen so far within the legal field and also, you know, primarily all fields is as technology has, has advanced, uh, in, in law, I mean, we used to, to research by going to the library and pulling out stacks of books as opposed to doing it online. 
we used to write hand letters and use typewriters uh, before we had you know, the internet and word processor. Right. Where they've been through some pretty magnificent changes yes. in technology that makes for dramatically more efficient. And there are more lawyers now than ever, and we're making more money than ever. Right. Right. So I think it's not a coincidence. I think what ends up happening is, you know, as you provide services that are better, cheaper, faster because of technology, you can get more demand for that those services. People people want, you know, more legal services that are currently being provided. And I think that trend continues, uh, maybe dramatically so. I mean, the statistic that is always just shocking to me is between 80 and 90% of Americans who have a legal problem and need legal help do not get it today. Wow. And so it's a it's an industry that makes $400 billion a year in the United States and has 80 or 90% of the people are of an untapped market. Wow. An enormous, enormous opportunity. Uh, it's a trillion dollar global market and it's just the tip of the iceberg because most people who need legal help um, in you know, small businesses doing contracts, uh, people who are you know, sued in small claims court, all kinds of things where it just doesn't make any sense to hire a $500 or $1,000 an hour lawyer. Right. All of a sudden become accessible because of technology. So I think I think that trend continues. That's super interesting. Something you said uh, at the beginning there, uh, I think really resonated and I've heard the same sentiment other places, right? With, you know, lawyers when they first come in saying like, well, you know, why'd I go to law school for this? I was, you know, recently talking to someone who um, he essentially has a startup. He worked in Hollywood doing production. Um, and, uh, you know, the first number of years working on those movies when you do video editing is just really tedious tasks where you're cropping around people frame by frame, takes you days and months. And essentially he's developed an AI that can do that. Um, and, and I think a lot of these AI, you know, while people say like, oh, you know, AI is going to take jobs or whatever. At the end of the day, it's it's doing a lot of really painful, tedious tasks so that, uh, you know, professionals can do their best work, what they're most excited about, what takes the most creativity and um, and whatnot. So I, I definitely see that with, with what you guys are doing. I think that's really impressive. Can you share some success stories um, or, you know, impactful results from law firms or legal departments that have integrated co-counsel into their, their workflows and what they're doing? Yeah, we've been really blown away with some of the reactions that we're getting from co-counsel. And I think that that's part of why, you know, as a, as a company, we were building for 10 years, but we launched this product like literally six months ago, left fewer than six months ago, mm -hmm. and have already exited for $650 million, you know, with the so-called 10 year overnight success. Um, right. I think a lot of that was driven by these, uh, by these success stories. I mean, the California Innocence Project has published a piece or, mm -hmm. you know, kind of been kind of public about how they, you know, have a very limited staff, right. Um, as a nonprofit that's doing really important work, I mean, what they literally do is they find innocent people in prison and help them get out of prison. It's like one of the most important things you could possibly be doing. And one of the challenges they had is they had so many people applying to have their cases reviewed by them and not enough people to really deeply investigate all those case files as fast as they wanted to review them. And the California Innocence Project started loading up those files, you know, sometimes thousands of pages of long, pages long, witness reports, police reports, testimony from the trial, et cetera, to look for patterns that would give them an indication of whether this is the case they want to take on. Okay. And, and they've estimated that what would sometimes people will be waiting for four years to get their cases even reviewed, whether they're sitting in jail, possibly innocent, by the California Essence Project is brought down to two years or less, right? So there's, there's wow. two years of time. That's incredible. Um, and that's just one, one example. Another example, kind of on the other end of the spectrum, of very large law firms. Um, we were working with a firm that had a client who's whose board was under investigation for something pretty serious. Okay. And they um, started loading up the files, you know, millions of files, teams, messages, emails, et cetera, that, you know, could help understand whether the, there, there is a potential violation, whether they need to, um, you know, uh, really deal with this investigation in one way or another. And within days, they started finding files that were relevant to the, to the inquiry that they're able to hand over to the DOJ that help them de-escalate the situation. This process would otherwise take taken you know six to twelve months of people hand reviewing document after document after document. And actually, that firm they're probably going to have the people review those documents anyways because mm -hmm. it's a no stone unturned. You know, be very careful about things. But they right. were able to get answers within days. And the client service there, that turnaround of, of being able to go back to the client and say, "Hey, we found the following following documents that we believe are concerning. We're going to." Um, you know, kind of strategize around this, et cetera. 
um, is just unheard of in the yeah. right now because it's just too hard to deal with that massive amount of quantity in that short term, sh- short amount of time frame and turnaround. Yeah, that's incredible, and that that time definitely does make a make a difference in those cases. What are some challenges you faced in integrating AI into the legal industry, and how have you overcome them? Right, this is obviously a highly regulated industry. Um, definitely uh, not one that a lot of everyone is taking on. Um, but you've obviously been able to kind of jump in and be quite successful here. So, what are what are the challenges that you've had to overcome? Well, the first challenge is building a really good product around this, and it's it's not trivial to build a great product around the current state of large language models. They are, um, you know, without grounding them in real information, they're, they're prone to hallucination, which is they make this stuff up. Um, they, uh, or, or having inaccuracies, uh, they are expensive. They have a limited, what's a, what's called context window. They can only read a short amount of, of text at a time. A lot of the, the early breakthroughs for us were based on the fact that we were working with large language models for, since their inception basis over about the last five years and had a lot of um, institutional knowledge and uh, you know workflow built around all of that going into this latest wave with GPT-4 especially. Uh-huh. Um, but it's still very, very, very challenging to build out right, the right tests, the right um, uh, safeguards, the right processes to get a, to engineer your way around what otherwise be extremely challenging um, issues with building products in the legal space with using large language models. And then after overcoming that, um, in some ways the product's the easy part, the next part is um, even after you've built something really incredible in a field like legal that is highly regulated, a bit conservative, uh, you have to really go above and beyond to reach your market and to help people understand the, the benefits and value here and to make sure that they don't, um, you know, to, to um, make sure they aren't as scared, you know, at least unnecessarily scared of this technology as they ought not to be. So it's a major education program, a major marketing program, a lot of effort around sales. Um, a lot of effort around support and, and customer success. Uh, you know, all that needs to just be absolutely stellar when you're bringing a new product in a new category to a market like this. Because um, without that, the, the kind of human side and the that the connection, I think people naturally will, especially in this field, naturally distrust and naturally you know, take their time, et cetera. And the way we view this is like that's a disservice to them. Mm-hmm. Uh, there is amazing technology right now that can help them with their practice and, and ultimately help their clients, whether it be get out of jail or get off death row or save their business or win a patent or what have you. And we view it as part of our mission to make sure that they they deeply understand and hear how this technology can be beneficial and and we go kind of above and beyond there. So we view that as, as part of our mission, but it's it does not come uh, naturally or easy for them. So you need to, to really help show them the path. Yeah. For sure, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I I remember a little while ago you're you're talking a bit about the fact that uh, a lot of this is possible because of LLMs and kind of where this the industry is today and, and some of the incredible products you've recently launched. And you know you're, you're mentioning that if you had a uh, you know pitched that um, back at inception, people would have laughed at you like this was impossible. I'm curious what that looked like um, when you originally you know got this kicked off. Were you originally bootstrapped? Did you? Go raise funding. What was that pitch like? What were you? What were you talking with? Uh, you know, investors or, or people about back then at the inception. So we're definitely venture backed, and we started with YC and um, raised a seed round, a Series A, a Series B, and then finally a Series C before before exit. Um, and from day one, we had the prescience to say uh, there is a big problem here in legal where technology is underserving lawyers. That the state of the art of, of current consumer facing technology is dramatically better than where um, the state of, of technology you know, is for, uh, for lawyers and that there's a major market opportunity here. But what that state-of-the-art technology was has really, really shifted over time. In the very early days, believe it or not, our major, major focus was around crowdsourcing, like building a Stack Overflow or Wikipedia or Quora for law um, because what we saw as a major hidden like, kind of gap is the intelligence layer that later AI would basically provide. Um, but we're, we're looking to build things along those lines. And at the time, you kind of transport yourself 10 years ago, those were, you know, the star companies and those were, that was the cutting edge technology. Um, you know, even like Yelp or GitHub, right? People, most of people's um, technological lives are based around input and information from other people. Uh, and we thought there's a real power that we can build in the law too. Uh, and to be honest, we didn't 
either that idea was not going to work in law ever, or we didn't execute on that, that okay. idea well. But either way, it was not what ended up being obviously the winning vision for us. And, and part of building one of these startups uh, is you do, you know, change course sometimes. You try things. You try a lot of things. Not all of them work. You learn a lot each time. I think it's part of why there are these, you know, quote unquote, ten year overnight successes. Mm -hmm. Part of that ten years is just making mistakes, yeah, um, or or under executing or going the wrong direction, and then figuring it out. Um, and so, um, you know, what's interesting though is you look at our pitch deck from five years ago or seven years ago. What you'll see is a vision at the very beginning of how law should transform it, and, and not unlike the way that the industrial revolution transformed the creation of physical goods. Um, right now, you know, what our decks would say then, as I was just looking at this, it's, fa it's fascinating how, how little in some ways the pitches change. Okay. And the technology under it's changed really dramatically. What we'd say then is, uh, you know, law, law practice is bespoke, it's handcrafted, it's, um, it is uh, kind of manual. Uh, and there are some benefits to that. You know, it feels kind of high end and high class, but it, there are also some major disadvantages. Um, just like, you know, back in the day before we had like Nike and Reebok, we had like shoe cobblers, right? Mm -hmm. And okay, well, if you like lived in a village with like one shoe cobbler, that's like all you're going to get. Like <laughs> right. that guy's good. <laughs> the gal's good. You get good shoes. If not, you know, and they're expensive and they, um, you know, uh, or don't have kind of the quality benefits of, of automation, all kinds of issues with um, pre-industrial revolution, or, you know, creation of physical goods, all of those still apply to the provision of, of legal and other professional services. And so from, from a pretty early stage of our company, we're saying this needs to change. Technology can change it. We're at this precipice of machine learning and artificial intelligence um, making a major impact there. And we are all in on that from, from very, very early on. And again, I think that's, that's, that's in part why we were able to do what we did is just be on that, um, uh, be on that precipice of AI. That, that's incredible. And you've done some incredible things from there. I know we ought to wrap up, but... As a final question, um, I would love to ask you where you see AI continuing to shape the legal industry uh, in the future. What are the new, you know, perhaps features you're looking at adding? Where you see this really going um, as we move forward from here? I think I think the the end state ideal platform for lawyers and other professionals is going to be an assistant that is in some ways like human in that you can converse with it, ask it to do tasks for you, et cetera, so it goes off and does tasks for you. And so it's superhuman and that it will do those tasks at an incredibly high level of efficiency and effectiveness. And so we started that project with co-counsel. Well, I think it can go way, way, way further. Um, it's about doing more things for people, right? So it currently does about eight tasks, legal research, document review, reviewing contracts, et cetera, are, are among those tasks that can do for what we call co-counsel skills. Um, we intend to make co-counsel far more skilled and that's just building in more and more capabilities of tasks that you can now delegate to your AI assistant. So that's thing one. The second thing is, is a constant iteration and investment in reliability. Um, we're already at an incredibly high place. Um, you know, we rank very favorably against the kind of manual way of doing things in terms of, uh, in terms of reliability, but we can always get better. And I think a consistent investment in finding all the edge cases, finding areas where it doesn't seem to understand deeply what's going on in this contract, how we help it understand better. Um, help them understand better what's going on in cases. I think that's another like really, really big investment. And then finally, I think it's about integrating. Like, like a good human assistant would be able to access my email, be able to access my files on my desktop, be able right? So I think it's about deep integrations with all my sources of data, information, billing information, et cetera, to make better decisions. And I think over the next three to five years or so, you're going to see these AI systems become way more capable. Um, in legal, it's going to, be able to do basically any task, whether it be making a timeline of all the events that happened in a case out of, out of all just the raw documents from that case, or um, reviewing way more documents, or I don't even, I guess right now we're in the millions, but do it faster, better, cheaper. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether it be um, put together kind of deep analyses of the opposing counsel and helping them fairly. Oh, there's all so many things that we as human lawyers do. A lot of it is grunt work. A lot of it can be improved dramatically um, by the application of this technology and i think that's that's the big next step um and so uh so i think a lot of it's just an extension of this this kind of project that's already underway and i think for its worth i think we're out there early with law i think that we are doing it you know i'm obviously biased when i say this because i love what we're doing 
I think we're doing this better in some ways than almost in any other profession. I think law mm-hmm. was almost a really great natural fit. Um, but I think you're gonna start seeing this pop up in medicine and in finance and tax, you know, and I think, um, I think it's all going to ex- expand along those ways, more skills and capabilities, more reliability, more integrations, um, and it, it kind of an, an increasingly easy interface into how you plug in and use these kind of technologies is, is the future. Here. That's so interesting. And I think, uh, it's a very exciting future to, to look forward to. It's going to democratize a lot of information for a lot of people. Um, Jake, thanks so much for coming on the show today and sharing your insights. Um, if people want to find you or try co-counsel, where, where do they go? You want to try co-counsel, go to casetex.com. And I am Jake at casetex.com. Always happy to get an email. So. Amazing. Thanks so much for coming on the show today. And for the listeners, thanks so much for listening to the AI Chat Podcast. Make sure to rate us wherever you listen to your podcasts and have an amazing rest of your day.